scripture says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4 and 4. So Jesus said, man cannot live simply with food. He has to live on every word that proceeds <coughs> out of the mouth of God. And I want you to get a picture of God opening his mouth and speaking and the word going forth. You kind of get that picture when you read Genesis. Let there be light. And let there be, <coughs> and God would speak things and create them. So you can't live without eating food. Is that fair to say? If you'd stop eating food long enough, you're not going to, you will stop living. Well, you can't live as a Christian without daily hearing the Word of God. You could exist and just live off physical food, but if you want to live as a believer, if you want to live as someone in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, you have to feed yourself daily with the Word of God. Christian cannot live by bread alone, and a Christian can't live by money alone. A Christian can't live by companionship alone. A Christian can't live by learning and gaining knowledge alone. And a Christian can't live by good deeds. You can't running around and doing good deeds doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in the garage makes you a Honda. And uh, a Christian, by the way, as surprising as this may sound, can't live by prayer alone. The Bible doesn't say we live by prayer. The Bible says we live by hearing every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we have a growing problem today in the body of Christ. And uh, it is a diminishing confidence because of a diminishing habit of daily getting in the Word of God and learning and making a diet of God's Word. We live in an age of ideas. We are bombarded through the digital world with thoughts and ideas. Many of them have been extrapolated from the Scriptures, but they've long since quit being the Word. They're just ideas that have come from the Word. And so Christians today are living as much by ideas as they are by the Word of God. So we need to get back to daily living on the Word of God. Listen, nothing else will energize your life. Everything that you do in life will drain you, no matter how good it is, no matter how fun it is. Think about it. Think of your favorite things that you do. Everything you do will drain you. The only way that you can re-energize your life is by hearing the Word of God. You know, it was listening to the words of the devil that killed man in the first place. Amen. So listening to the words of death brought death to mankind. But listening to the words of life bring resurrection. Mankind is the result of communication. Let there be. God communicated. So God said, let there be, let us, God said, make man in our image. We are the result of communication. And the human race ever since the fall has continued to be the result of communication. People move across the face of the earth, engage in activities, both peaceful and strifeful, both good and evil, being motivated, being moved by communication. Communication produces people, communication moves people. Words are seeds, and the Word of God is the seed of life. And just as seeds produce physical life, God's Word produces spiritual life. It's specifically the Word of God that produces spiritual life in you. Not your emotions, but what the thus says the Lord is. That's what produces spiritual life. 1 Peter 1.23 says, You have been born again, not by seed which perishes, but by the imperishable seed, that is, through the living and abiding Word of God. So Peter says, You were born again through the seed 
of the Word of God. You heard God's Word. It entered in like seed, opened up, and it produced the new creation on the inside of you. Now, just as natural seeds depend upon the conditions of their environment in order to succeed, so the Word of God requires listening. That's your environment. You can sit in the environment of a church. You can let a half hour or however long go by listening to the Word of God without hearing it. Just like you can plant seeds in your backyard. But if they're not watered through their environment with the sunlight and the, and the water, those seeds are there, but they're not going to open up and produce anything. Isn't that right? So Proverbs says in Proverbs 4, My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from before your eyes. Keep them in the center of your heart. Because, why? They are life to those who find them. You can sit in a church and walk out after hearing a great message. Doesn't mean you have found the words of life. And it says that if, if you attend to the word, incline, which means that you're leaning forward with, a, with an interest and a submission in your heart. And you're, you are not letting the word of God depart. When other ideas and thoughts come in and present themselves, when you have to give yourself to other things, when you think about other things, you can keep them from so cluttering your emotions, so cluttering your mind, that they obscure or they eclipse the Word of God. Don't let that happen. That's what, the Pro that's what Proverbs is saying. Don't let them depart from your eye. Don't let the life around you take off of the board in front of you the living word of God, and keep it in the midst of your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them and medicine to all of their flesh. Are you hearing that? God's word is medicine to all of our flesh. Are you taking your daily vitamins? Are you taking your, your Bible pills? Just because you've got a Bible and just because you listen to it on TV or the radio or might have to come to church and listen to a message doesn't mean that you're really hearing. Listening takes more than these physical ears. Jesus said, be careful what you listen to and with what measure you listen. There's a measure involved. There's a measurement involved in hearing everything that you hear. That measurement is called judgment. When you listen to something, you use judgment. You accept it and embrace it or you reject it. That's called measurement. That's what real hearing is about. And Jesus said, be careful the measure that you use when you hear the word of God. And so <clears throat> Proverbs says, my son, attend to my words. First of all, are you attending to the word of God? Or do you just, just roll into church once a week and hear it? And then it'll be another week before you hear the scriptures. Incline your ear. Lean in to the word of God, which means, in my mind, think about what you're hearing. Think about how it applies to your life. When Cindy was sharing those scriptures, I was sitting there and I was thinking, how does this apply to me? And I was thinking of that correcting word and putting the kingdom of God first and being an example rather than a shame to Jesus and what it took. And I realized that I had to think about what she was saying. I had to embrace it with judgment and open that, that precious lid of the treasure box in my heart and let that go in and treasure it and think about how I was going to do what she was saying. So listening and receiving is the X factor of God's word, listening and receiving. And I call it the X factor for the word exponential. Exponential is the multiplying factor of God's word. You receive God's word, a simple seed, but if you let it grow, if you hear it, if you receive it, if you act upon it, it doesn't stay a simple seed, does it? 
It grows. It produces roots in your life. It breaks forth into the sunlight. It puts out branches. All of a sudden, you are doing things you couldn't do before. How is that happening? It's the Word working in you. God's Word is growing right through your character, right through your personality. Isn't that awesome? We have, a, we have glory to God, a Word of God Barbara vine over there. That's that's what the vine looks like growing in Barbara's life. And the Word of God growing in Barbara's life looks a little different than the Word of God growing in Glenn's life. But we can see the consistent Word, the living God, Jesus, in each and every one of us. It's wonderful that Jesus came into the world and didn't demand, I want all of you to be exactly like, I want you to hold your mouth like I hold mine. I want you to stand like I want you to look like me. We'd all be, we'd be finished, not a single one of us. He allows us to be who we are because he knows that through the word, if we will listen and receive it, he will reconstruct himself in us. It's wonderful. So, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, when he spoke about plant, sowing the seed of God's word, and there were those three conditions where they were sown by the wayside, and the fowl got, got, ate up the word, it didn't produce fruit, and it was sown in rocky soil, no depth of earth, sown among thorns, choked it, it was unfruitful. But the fourth, the fourth condition in which God's word was sown was it was it was like you're doing this morning. I'm listening, listening to what Pastor Nick is saying. What is God saying? You know, he irritates me when he does this with his hand, but, but God is speaking, you know? So I, I come home after, uh, I, I just like all of you, I'll go home after Sunday and I'll we'll be getting some food or something. I'll look over to Kathy and I'll be like, <clears throat> <clears throat> And finally, I can't stand it anymore. And so I'll say, well, how was it? How was it? And she'll say, well, I had to listen with my eyes closed. Because I just can't take the hands flying all over the place. You know, It's like, that's cool. I get it. You know, as long as Jesus can come, as long as Jesus is coming through. There's some guys that have been up in the pulpit and they can't stand still. They can't stand still. They're like. And on this thing, you just hear every step and it's, it just drives me nuts. I'm, I want to just put a collar on them and chain them to the pulpit. Just ch- hold on, brother. Chain them to the pulpit. All right, go. But you know somebody. Some of them couldn't preach if they were chained to the pulpit. They'd stand there and they just they c- couldn't get it out. God lets you be you, but he expects you to hear and to freshly fill your life with the word of God constantly. Praise the Lord. And the ones that you've heard the most are probably the ones you need the most. Isn't that right? So so Jesus said on those who were the good soil that heard and received the word of God, listen to what he said. These are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and receive it and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Notice that phrase, they hear the word and receive it. There may be somebody here today that's going to hear the word and it's going to walk out and they're not going to receive it. And it's going to go right out of their mind because they didn't receive it. You see, the reason you can't remember the scriptures is because you don't receive them when you hear them. You say, well, I just have this, then write it down. Do like the teacher made you do in school. Write 100 times on the blackboard. (laughs) Kathy used to tell me all the time, "I I can't remember scripture like you remember. I said, yeah, well, I write it out. I'm constantly studying. I got... I've got bookcases filled with binders and notepads of notes I've taken through the years. I'm writing them out. And I just don't put the little reference. I've got to write it out. There's something that compels me. I don't know. It's like the spirit of the scribe or something comes over me. I've got to write the verse out. And that was before digital. Now digitally, you know, we do it all on these things. But there's something about physically having to write it out. So I would say to her, well, you know, I remember it because I'm writing it out. 
What does it take to get the word in you so you remember it? And you say, well, I don't think scripture memorization or quoting the Bible is. Have you ever noticed that the things the world criticizes are exactly what the devil wants to rob from the church? Amen. Have you ever noticed that? You constantly hear unsafe, and what do they know? What do people who are spiritually dead and full of darkness, what do they know? Yet we pay such attention. We change our services. We restructure the way we do everything we do in church. Pastors even filter their messages through the anticipation of what unsafe people are going to think. We let the dead set the temperature for the words of life. Is that nutty? Is that, isn't that weird? It's not the temperature that brings people to Jesus. It's the word. And we need to get that word out. Listen, sinners get saved hearing messages that make them angry. Amen. Believe me, there have been millions of people that, that have come into the kingdom of God sitting in services like this. Who he think he's talking to? Oh, this is just... Well, I'm not coming back here. Next thing you know, tears are streaming. They're at the altar. Jesus, God, come into my life. Forgive me. What happened? You see, you can get saved hearing words that make you mad. Your emotions don't have anything to do with it, except when they get in the way of your receiving what the Lord is saying. So those that hear and receive the word, it produces fruit in them. If no fruit's being produced, add receiving to your hearing. Paying attention. That's whether you're reading the scriptures in the morning or whenever you're reading the Bible yourself, um, or whether you're listening to a message or watching it preached on television or listening on the radio or whatever, whatever mode or media Outlet is bringing the, the word of God to you. When you're, when you're listening, paying attention determines the effect of God's word upon you. That will determine how effective the word you're hearing will be. How much attention are you paying? How, well, let me ask it, let me put it like this. How do you hear and receive the word of your doctor? Well, if you, if you have a copay or you don't have insurance and you have full pay, you go to the doctor, you pay for that five minutes that he's talking to you. Guess what you're doing? You're listening. Amen. You listen. Hold on. Back up, doc. Say that again. Wait, can you write that down? Yeah, I'll give you a, I'll give you a printout. How many of you go home? after a doctor visit, and your wife or your husband says, well, what'd they say? I forgot. You forgot? Your, your big toe is turning black and falling off. You're not going to have an appointment for another six months. Hair's growing out of the middle of your forehead. You asked him about that. What'd he say? Well, I forgot. I wasn't paying attention. How do you hear and receive the word of a doctor? You pay attention. How about your, um, your investment advisor? You care about what happens to your investments, your money. When your investment advisor speaks to you, you probably listen. You probably take notes. And then you go do something about what they say. If you don't, what happens? You miss that opportunity to make money or you lose money. What about your physical trainer? I know it looks like a lot of us haven't been paying too much attention to the physical trainer lately. But, uh, you know, the holidays are going to be over with soon and we'll be listening. But you can, you can pay a lot of money for a physical trainer, but if you don't listen to what they say, if you don't do it, nothing's going to change in your life. Why do you think God's Word should be any different? If you don't pay attention... If you don't listen, if you don't go back again and again and read and listen to what God is saying in his word, it's not going to have an effect in your life. And then people get mad at God. 
They're mad at God because he didn't answer their prayers. They're mad at God because things aren't going right. Their life is bumpy and, and full of tribulation and difficulties, and they get angry. And they make these assumptions. God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me. But the fact matters, they don't pay any attention to him. They don't bother hearing what he's saying. They don't know what he, they don't know what God's opinion is on most anything in life. Why not? Because they've never bothered to read. They don't know what God says. But they expect God, God's results in their life. That doesn't make sense to me. So, in the, in the book of Micah, in the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 7, there's a, there's a verse that I've always liked. And I don't know if you've heard it before, but it goes like this. Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Now, <clears throat> probably the modern um, uh, thought of that verse might be, do not my words do good, period. And we sort of expect that. Well, when, when, when I hear the promise of God, I expect the good result of God's promise because I believe that when I hear it. But that's really not what God said. God said, my words do good to those who walk uprightly. See, if you're not walking in righteousness, if you make no effort whatsoever to walk in an upright fashion, why do you expect that God's word is going to have a good result in your life? It isn't going to happen. Are you listening? You see, I said in the very beginning of this message, we were produced by communication. God spoke us into existence. And when he spoke, what did God say? Let me make man in my image and after my likeness. I want man to be like me. So when you don't bother to be God-like, why do you expect the blessing of his word to come to pass in your life? They're mutually exclusive from each other. And yet, even Christians haven't gotten this straight. They haven't worked this out in their mind. You cannot live or walk in an ungodly way, and yet expect at the same time godly results when it comes to the blessings of God in your life. My words do good to those who walk uprightly. There's a couple of other translations of that exact same phrase, and I, I bothered to bring them to you this morning just because they bring up a little different nuance, but it's really, I think, helpful. One of them says, if you would do what is right, you would find my words comforting. People will oftentimes throw the Bible back at you. There's no comfort in these words. These are just empty words. But God said, if you would do what is right, you would find my words comforting. To people who have no interest in walking upright before God, his words are comfortless to them. They have no comfort. But people who appreciate, remember I've said to you when I've talked about thanksgiving, those that appreciate, appreciate. They appreciate in value. They ask, they go up, they elevate in value. Well, it's the same thing here. When you pursue righteousness with God, guess what? His words are wonderful comfort to you because that's where you've put your value. One of the, the other translation that I came across that I thought was really good, it says, to be sure my commands bring a reward for those who obey them. Oh, what a novel thought. <laughs> God's word brings rewards. Oh, but darn, you've got to obey it. See, if you have no intention of doing what the word says, then why are you angry when the blessings of God, according to his word, aren't coming forth in your life? I, I could just pound this pulpit with that truth over and over again, but I'm I'm seeing the nodding and everything. I know that you get it. So listen, a way to say it um, would be to say God's words work like nature. That's why Jesus used the nature example of planting, cultivating the seed, and it produces fruit according to how it's been cultivated. God's words work like nature, not like charity. Jesus is giving. He has given more than 
you and I in one lifetime will ever need. Nobody can accuse the Father who gave us himself through his Son of not giving. But I have to say, God's word does not work through charity. It's not like when you're, you know, a drug addict and you've ruined your family. Uh, please don't be upset with me because I'm sharing a social fact. But you're, you, 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 can't, you don't keep your job. You're a drug addict. The girl that married you and produced two or three of your children has begged you, but, but you, know, you keep embracing that lifestyle, walking off and leaving her, and now you're living in the street. And so here comes the faithful Christians with sandwiches and soup and everything and feeding you every day and helping you live in the street. Are you listening to me? I know this. Some, somebody is probably not liking this. But helping you live in the street rather than get up and go to God and help him get you back home and back to your life, give your life back to you. So listen to me. God's word doesn't work like charity. He doesn't feed you and bless you in your rebellion. He doesn't help you stay rebellious, bless you while you're ignoring his word. Why would God do that? We would learn the very opposite of what he's trying to teach us. It would be so confusing. We would believe that, that when God says that we should walk upright before him, that he really didn't mean it because he's going to bless us anyway, even when we live a life of rebellion. Does that make sense? How many moms and dads or grandparents do we have here? Am I telling the truth? All right, thank you, Jesus. Um, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said to the disciples, this was also in the parable of the sower, right after that parable, he said, take care about what you hear, because the measure you use will be the measure you receive, and more will be added to you. So if we're cavalier and disinterested and selective, um, if we don't like, if we turn away, if we reject the word of God because we don't like the way the person sounded or looked who was delivering the word of God, um, so we reject it, throw the baby out with the bathwater, then Jesus said, take care what the way in which you hear God's word. We're too concerned with style today. Wait, and our churches prove it. What you have to do to get people to listen to the Word of God, you know, it probably, if you could quantify it and put a dollar figure on it, maybe a hundred years ago, accounting for inflation, somebody ought to work this out in a seminary somewhere, um, it might have cost, say, a hundred dollars or a thousand, just pick a number, let's say a thousand, thousand dollars, for one sinner saved. Thousand dollars invested by the ministry for one person to hear the word of God and act upon it. Today, 10 million. 10 million. Got to have the lights. Got to have all the stuff. Got to have, you know, the restaurant in the lobby. Gotta, and I'm not saying any of this stuff is wrong or bad, but I'm saying that people's aperture their appetite, their aperture, their, their, their interest in truth has become so narrow and so selective and so controlled by their emotions and by their particular idiosyncrasies that it takes tremendous, tremendous amount of money and research and, and uh, uh, socio-demographic studies to figure out how we can get this person propped up and just right so they'll pay attention. And we're talking about people that are saved and spirit-filled. <laughs> we're, not, we're not even talking about the sinners. Talk about saved and spirit-filled people. Just play that song they don't like or an old one from three months ago. Amen. Take care because the measure that you use to receive God's word will be the measure God uses to bless you with. And he said, Jesus, that's exactly what Jesus said. So when, when, 
Why do people have to work five and ten jobs? Why do people have to? Because God's not blessing people as much. Because they're depending on society. They're depending upon the world. We, we need to do so much more just to keep ourselves together because we ought to be living on the Word. God ought to be multiplying and blessing. Amen. But our lives are being ground away in the world when we could be serving the Lord and Him blessing and multiplying us and we're winning souls along the way. The measure that you choose with which you listen to God's Word. Does God's Word have a place on your job, in your life, in your activities, in your recreation? Or are you off the clock? Which means God's off the clock. When you're out there, do the people around you have an opportunity to hear the Word of God? Do they have an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus? Or is there a sign across the door of your life that says, closed until Sunday? The measure that you measure out in, in how you handle the Word of God is the measure God uses. You're before the Lord. Say, Lord, bless me. You know I need this. Help my life. The Lord says, sure, no problem. Absolutely. Let me have your measure. Let me have your measuring cup. Oh, God, that isn't going to work. I, I need a real blessing. Well, then you should have thought about using a bigger measuring cup when it came to dipping into my Word. Amen? You say, I don't, is that really what Jesus meant? Well, let's see. He went on in the next breath and said, For whoever has, more will be given. And whoever does not have, even from him, will be taken what he has. So the person who's got more because they have paid attention more, God said, I'm going to give them more on top of that. And the person who really just has very little interest in the Word of God get Enjoy it while you've got it. You probably don't. You're not going to miss it because it, it's about to go away. <laughs> I know you're not getting any of this. That's all right. Praise the Lord. Christians' relationship with God. Listen to me now. Christians' relationship with God is regulated by their relationship with His Word. Amen. That's the throttle of your relationship with God. It's your relationship with the Scriptures. 1 right. Peter 2 and 2 says, Like newborn babes... Long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you might grow in respect to salvation. Your spiritual growth, your relationship with God is based on your relationship with his word. You know, secularism, we live in a secular society. Um, thinkers and philosophers and theologians alike have determined we live in a postmodern era, which means we have gone from uh, living in a uh, a, a biblical era to living in a postmodern era, which means that something called modernism, we call it secularism, has occurred in our society. And we're way past that now, and we're living in a postmodern secular culture. And too many Christians are living according to the secular culture that they're living in. And I'm not talking about this nonsense that, that Christians always miss what God is saying by getting involved in all external holiness issues, you know. Christians have got to have a certain uniform, and, you know, if you don't conform in the way that you look or dress or whatever, then, you know, you're not conforming. But God, God looks upon the heart. And he looks upon what kind of relationship do we have with his word. And it will show up in your life. But secularism is measured. And I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I don't. I'm just going to roll it out to you. Um, and I believe you can just grab hold of it. Secularism is measured by relationship with truth. Relationship with truth. The world's relationship with the concept of truth determines how secular it is. And right now, our world is very secular. Pilate represented the secular world when he said, what is truth? What does it matter? He said to Jesus, what is truth? Truth is irrelevant. I am relevant. Truth is irrelevant. That's what Pilate was saying. What does truth matter? I matter. I'm the one who can condemn you to the cross. I matter. What does truth matter? And he said it because Jesus, when he asked Jesus, are you a king? He said, yes, in my kingdom is of the truth. And those that hear the truth are in my kingdom. 
My kingdom is, is governed and founded upon, bound by the truth. You see, in a secular world, people supersede truth. Truth is subject to people. Truth is something under the feet of people. People reign. What people think, what people want. That's a secular society. But in the kingdom of God, truth is set over individuals. In, a, in the kingdom of God, individuals serve the truth. And Jesus is the truth made flesh. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says it like this. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, like secular thinkers, but as it really is in truth, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now there's a lot here. I don't have the time to break it down, but I just will point out that he is basically saying to the Thessalonians, when we preach the gospel to you and you heard it, you took it out from under your feet and you put it up over your head. You said, this is God speaking. Paul said, even though we, simple men, spoke it to you, when you heard it, you said, this is God speaking. God is speaking to us. And he said, because you handled it that way, rather than a secular approach, which takes all truth and, and makes that all truth a servant to you. Well, if this makes sense to me, then it'll be truth. If it doesn't make sense to me, it's not truth. That's why people say, even Christians, even people that fill churches, are not walking in any power. There's no power of God manifest in many believers' lives today because they put the truth under their own feet. They make themselves lord over the truth they hear. How it adapts to their life is what makes it worth elevating. But he said to the Thessalonians, the reason why the word is working in you, that word work is the Greek word energio. We get the word energy from it. In other words, God is energized within you because you received his word as the word of God, not as the word of men. In Psalm 138, verse 2, God said that I exalt my word over my name. Another verse says, I magnify my word above my name. I thought about that. God's name, the name the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. In, in the prayer that he gave us, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But he proceeded by saying, hallowed, holy is your name. But that holy name in Psalm 138, verse 2, God said, I magnify my word above my name. Why would God exalt or put above his own name, his word, seeing that his name is holy? And I believe the reason that God would do that is because people try to use his name while ignoring the word that he has spoken to them by which they might be healed and delivered. You see, God said, I elevate or magnify my word above my name because the word is what will change and help you. People can run around and say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all day long and never change, nothing happens. But when you begin to submit to the word of God, when you begin to believe the word of God, when you act on the word of God, guess what? It's seed, it produces fruit, it produces change. And God is not interested in being famous. He doesn't need to be famous. God does not have an ego. His name is holy. There's nothing you can do against the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to diminish it. But the reality, the fact of the matter is that His Word will transform your life. And so in Psalm 107 it says, Some were foolish, and they rebelled, and they suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble. 
and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. So how did God save them? First of all, he said they're fools because they were running around doing their own secular thing. And guess what? They did it when they were in their 20s, full of energy and life, and it's like I got the world by the tail. Then in their 30s, eh, you know, still going strong in my stupid ways, ignoring everything, ignoring everybody, ignoring God, doing my own thing. In my 40s, now it's really a habit. Now I'm really trapped in my own circle. 50s, 60s, now you're in your 60s, 70s, you're looking in the rearview mirror of life, and you're the same as you were, doing the same thing in your 20s. You haven't gotten anywhere. God said, you fools would not listen then. You didn't listen in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Now in your 70s or 80s, you are at death's door. You're still diseased, still sick. Now it's about to take you down. Are you listening to me? This is the word of God. And they cried out to him. The Lord's compassionate. He doesn't sit there and kick kick you to the curb and go, you know, you should have listened when you had enough energy to do something about it. He never does that. The Bible says he had compassion on them and he sent them his word. Because everyone can hear the word. Anyone can hear it and act on it. I don't care where you are in life. You can hear the word of God. How does God lift us after a lifetime of screwing our life up uh, by our own hand. How does God do that? He sends his word and snatches us from death's door. But if you're not interested in the word, what's left? What, what's left? There the foolish per- person is accusing God after they've ignored his word. What, what's not left? The Bible uses two different words to describe the Word of God, and I kind of need to bring this to a close, but I I need to mention these two words. Many of you probably already know. One is logos, and the other is what? Rhema. Rhema. The, The Word of God is the logos, and the Word of God is the rhema. The Bible refers to God's Word as logos and rhema. And both forms of God's Word, the logos and the rhema, are necessary for you to have a robust life in the Word of God. Now, speaking of logos, the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. That word, Word, is logos. And logos is the most commonly used expression in the Bible that describes the Word of God. And it refers to the entire revelation of God spoken out in his word and it is the entire revelation of God in every form spoken written and ultimately the Bible says Jesus is the word made flesh or the logos made flesh so if you want to read the Bible follow Jesus around watch everything he does listen to everything he says that's the whole totality of what God has said characterized in Jesus the other word is rhema And the word rhema differs from the word logos. They're the same thing. They're the word of God. But it's characterized by the scripture when the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word or every rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. So rhema is the same as logos, but it's different in the sense that rhema is the utterance of the Word of God. It is a specific spoken Word of God. It is the Word of God that is directed to you. It is the Logos taken and spoken directly. So, by and listen to this, by always connecting the idea of the Word of God to the fact that God is speaking it, Rhema prevents logos from becoming simply ideas that are separated from God. The person who has a grasp on rhema and logos will understand that the Bible is not just a collection of ideologies and philosophies and nice ideas. And there are a lot of churches today that treat the Word of God simply as logos, but they never treat it as rhema. 
And so what happens is they take the scriptures and they come up with, well, a, a kind of a uh, social culture, if you will. These are ideas. They're simply ideas, not to be taken literally. We take these ideas, and then after a while, it's not the Word of God, is it? What makes the Word of God the Word of God is that it's coming out of God's mouth. God is saying it, which means it's what He's thinking when He says it that matters, not what you think He means, but what He thinks He means. When you listen to the Word of God, do you say, well, what does this mean to me? Or do you say, what does it mean to you, Lord? I don't know, just something to think about. Call me crazy, but I think that's probably the more healthy way to handle it. So, Logos and Rhema both describe God's Word as something to learn and something to do. So, I think of Logos as what I learn and what brings wisdom to my life, and I think of Rhema as what I do. It's the Word of God that I do. Praise the Lord. So, <clears throat> Proverbs 10, 17, and with this we're going to have an altar call. Um, Proverbs 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God preached. So, in short, faith is produced when we learn what God has said so that we can hear what His Spirit is speaking to us. How do I know what the rhema of God is? Because I learn and submit to the Logos, the Word of God. So God's Word was spoken. It's unchangeable, but He is wanting to speak it to you today, into your life today. And that rhema will produce faith. Faith comes by hearing, and the ability to hear comes by embracing God's Word. So here's the altar call. In Old Testament times, did you know that God withdrew from speaking to His people because they ignored His Word? Ignoring the Word of God caused the Spirit of God to stop speaking through the prophets. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our own life. But when you ignore the Scripture, the Holy Ghost will stop speaking inside of you. He won't leave you, but he'll stop talking. 1 Samuel 3, 1 says, And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Because the people quit listening to the word of God. So God quit speaking to the prophets. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or of thirst for water, but rather a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Why would God pull back his word and cause a famine of hearing the word of God to come upon a society? Because it has embraced secularism. Now sinners are going to embrace secularism. That's not why God stopped speaking. It's when his people embrace secularism. When God's people who ought to be living at the altar of his word push it aside for the ideas of a secular world, then God says, I'm going to stop talking to them because they're not listening. They're not listening to this, so why should I bother speaking the rhema word to them. So, <coughs> I don't want to end on a negative note, but just so that you can get the importance of this, Hebrews 1.3 says that God is upholding all things. Everyone say upholding all things. God is upholding all things by the rhema, the continuous spoken, currently speaking, proceeding word the Bible says, God is upholding all things by the rhema of His power. By the rhema of His power. Dunamis, power. Hallelujah. So today, if you will live, by the way, the Bible, I keep going to this. This is the library of God. It's God's library. Do you spend time in God's library? This is God's library right here. 
Spending too much time away from God's library will leave you weak and living off of ideas that you think are what God said rather than knowing what God has said because you've heard him speaking to you through his word. So the Bible says he upholds all things by the word, the rhema of his power. So if you'll live in God's library, everyone has a library. How many of you spend time living in your library? God's got a library. And it's not there so that you can show your friends, I've got God's library. If you'll live in God's library, then the Holy Spirit will cause the rhema of God's power to uphold you. If he upholds all things by the word of his power, then your life will be upheld. And it doesn't matter how goofed up, how messed up, how crazy. It doesn't matter what, the, what Joe Biden does. doesn't matter what uh, the energy secretary does. doesn't matter what the school board's doing. Not that those things are irrelevant to society, but to you, to your life, where you live, where, what's going to happen to you today. What really matters is God upholding me. Is God upholding me? God said, I will uphold you with the word of my power. I uphold all things by the word of my power. Things that are being upheld today are being upheld because the, they are receiving the rhema word of God. And God's rhema word is lifting them up. You see stuff that is, is falling apart. That's a sure sign that who's ever in control of that is not submitting that to the rhema word of God. Whatever is falling apart, the word of God is not upholding it. Whatever's being upheld, God's word's upheld, upholding it. Glory to God. I want a life that's being upheld. How about you? I want you to close your Bible stand with me this morning.